Hello and welcome back to Fourth Age, guys. This episode will consider the Elven Realm, one of the probably most popular factions in the Fourth Age Total War. This is a mod for Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion. Uh, and if you are interested in playing as the Elves, you'll have to go to a slightly different space in the menu. Manish Campaign is where you will find all of the factions uh, of, of the Manish factions, so Rohan, Arad, the Reunited Kingdom, and so on. If you would like to play as the Elves or the Dwarves, you'll have to go into that non-Manish Campaign section, and you can find them right here. The Elven Campaign is interesting. There are some unique challenges to it. On the one hand, the Elves are blessed with some of the best units in the mod. They've got an incredibly strong roster, very versatile in many different roles. They can be extremely effective. However, they are hampered and limited greatly by population. Uh, in case you are unaware, the Fourth Age mod is set, of course, in the Fourth Age. So this is after the War of the Ring. This is after uh, the Three Rings of Power of the Elves have left. So Elrond, Galadriel, Círdan, Celeborn, some of the biggest names among the Elves in Middle-earth are no longer here. There are some that remain, but the idea behind the mod, the theme of the Elves, is one of decline. And so what you will be struggling with is low and, in some cases, shrinking population that will only be made lower by your recruiting of your native troops. And it's for that reason I believe that the Elves have been estimated at a laughing at live dragons difficulty. That is, uh, we've we have determined that for most people they're probably going to find this faction one of the hardest factions in the mod. Now we have made some relatively recent changes to the Elves that in my opinion uh, just balance the campaign out to make it a bit more easy. So I might now, if, if I were writing this, I might change it to uh, bull roaring. Uh, I, I might estimate it as bull roaring rather than laughing at live dragons. Of course, whenever you play, we recommend that you, you keep them on the, the settings here. So we're going to go with the decidedly Tookish campaign and bull roaring battle difficulty. This difficulty factor is just the estimation of how we anticipate the faction is going to behave. Uh, as you can see from the map here, though, the elves occupy some very diverse territory. We have combined all of the major known elven realms at the end of the Third Age into a single faction. This is for a couple of reasons, one of which is, uh, is well, gameplay. That's, that's, that's actually quite a large one. Um, this avoids or allows us to avoid having elven factions warring with each other or causing unpleasant alliances and, and wars. So this keeps things relatively simple. Um, the other reason is just that this is, a, again, a time of, of great decline for the elves, and it's unlikely that you're going to see lots of independent elven warlords um, springing up. So what we decided to do, we'll jump into the campaign here, is we have set your faction leader as one of the, the, the major elves of the, the period who we assume is still kicking around in the Fourth Age, and that would be the Elven King Thranduil. Nothing is known of his fate in terms of the actual lore, uh, and so we figured he probably would have stuck around uh, into the Fourth Age, and so he is your faction leader at the beginning of the game. Correspondingly, your capital is the Elven King's Halls. Uh, there's another settlement that you own, Emmanduir, right next to it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, shut off the fog of war here for right now. We'll take that back off in a second. But just to give you a sense of what you're starting with, um, you have a couple of settlements right here in the northern part of Mirkwood, now renamed Greenwood. These settlements will get you some interesting elven troops, uh, mostly, as you might expect, archer types. So at the highest level of elven recruitment, which we'll get to in a moment, you can find um, threshold troops, which are sort of a typical spear unit, sylvan axes, uh, greenwood bows, and greenwood guards, both archers with axes one-handed and two-handed respectively, and then elven scouts and uh, a mounted archer unit, very powerful uh, as well. So that's what you can expect to find in northern Mirkwood. You also start with some land around uh, Lorien and then east Lorien, Amon Lank. This is of course the site of Dol Guldur, but in the, at the end of the return, or, or the, at the end of the War of the Ring, uh, the elves of Lorien crossed the river Anduin and drove out all of the servants of Sauron here and reestablished the region of East Lorien. So we have given it that name. These two settlements, therefore, will share um, units in terms of recruitment. So instead of the Greenwood types, you are going to see some Galadrim troops. So Galadrim scouts 
and Galadrim Warriors are going to be the two different units you can train out of here. These are a stronger, kind of a hybrid, male-armed uh, bow and sword unit, and Galadrim Scouts are a bow and sword unit as well. So lots of archers with the elves. You also, your third sort of zone of recruitment that you start with is the Lindon region. And here you've got these two settlements of Forland and Harland, very small population. They are they are always going to be static in terms of population growth. Uh, but you have Mithlond as well, which from turn one can actually see positive growth. This is the only settlement that you start with that is going to grow from the very beginning of the campaign. So it's important to realize that and also to note just how small the population is. So there's 500 uh, here, at the, 500 elves, uh, so to speak, in Mithlond that are considered able-bodied at the beginning of the campaign, but there is a population floor or recruitment floor of 400. So you will never get lower. You, you, it, if you get to 400 people through training or through uh, population uh, loss, it's not going to get any lower than that. So what that means is you really only have 100 elves to work with. So if you were to queue up a unit of Threshold Spears, that's it. You could train one unit of Mariners or two units of Mariners or one, one unit of Mariners and one of Archers. Let's take a quick look at the units that are available in the Mithlon region, though. And so they're going to be a little bit different. You will have the Threshold Troops Spear types. Uh, but at the second tier, you will get Mariners, which are a very strong uh, sword and shield unit. Uh, kind of a generic Elven Bows unit, the incredibly strong Lindon Guards. And then uh, a, a very nice cavalry unit for you, Elven Riders, with a sword. So their charge uh, bonus is, is not as, as high as it would be for a spear-armed cavalry unit, but still very respectable, very good defense, as all of your Elven units have. So that's what you have to work with at the beginning of the campaign. Let's take a quick look at your goals, and we'll see that you start off with seven. You need to get 30 in order to win, and two of those um, are indicated specifically. In addition to your starting settlements, you need to acquire Austin Edel, which is the settlement right down here, right to the west of the Duero Delph, west of Moria. This was the former region of Holland, and so this is uh, the ruins, actually, of Austin Edel which you can rebuild, which we'll talk about shortly, and Rivendell. You do need to recapture this. Uh, you may be dismayed to learn that the cultists of the Kingdom of Adunabar, uh, who are, are kind of the main villain of the mod, uh, have actually kicked you out of Rivendell, and you need to get it back as per your victory conditions. Once you do, though, Rivendell is a, is a very important place, as you might well imagine. You can rebuild the, the House of Elrond here, the Library of Elrond, which will give you some nice faction-wide bonuses. You can also train some uh, Imladris Lancers, which are an excellent cavalry unit. And you can retrain one of your unique units at Rivendell only. Let's talk about that first. Naldor Swords, right out, starting right outside Mithlond, this is a one only unit for you. You cannot train these ever, but if you take losses, you can retrain those losses, but only in Rivendell once you've captured it and upgraded it. So conquering uh, Rivendell and taking it back is going to be one of the major uh, goals uh, of the mod. And to help you with that, you do have the benefit of this character right here, Glorfindel of Imladris, um, who is, yes, that is that Glorfindel from the, uh, the Fellowship of the Ring, who helped escort Frodo to Rivendell and had some major impact in, in the previous uh, lore, which you can read about, uh, some of which here. The, the main advantage of Glorfindel is he commands this unit of Noldor Riders, uh, which is another unique unit. You cannot train these ever again, and the the very unfortunate thing about them is once Glorfindel passes into the West, which he will inevitably, this unit is gone forever. And it's hard to um, explain just how effective this unit is. This is an incredibly powerful uh, 44 charge bonus on top of an attack of 25. They've got a defense of 69, uh, three hit points, as opposed to the typical two for most elven units. They cause fear, they're effective against armor, there's a bonus against riders and large creatures, i.e. trolls. So there is just nothing that these guys can't take down practically, and you can wipe out entire stacks practically with this unit alone. But there is a bit of a time a problem in the long run, and this is the case for the elves. You will be dominant on the tactical frame. Uh, in battles, you are going to have an absolutely uh, wonderful time, but 
on the stri strategic frame of things, on the, the campaign map, you're going to have to manage your resources very well because Glorfindel, like all of your family members, will depart into the west. So mechanically, we have uh, because we're dealing with the Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion engine, we do not have immortal, actually immortal characters. But we have sort of flavorfully renamed the, the death mechanic into sailed into the west. And this is actually pretty lore accurate. You are not going to have a lot of elves sticking around uh, in Middle Earth, high elves especially. So make the use of Glorfindel while you have him is the point here. Because you will be able to basically uh, clean house with your enemies in this region. Um, let's talk for a moment about population and what the problem is. So I mentioned that Mithlond is the only place that is going to have actual um, positive population growth. And if I w am to actually put every settlement on low taxes, uh, which I'll do right here, it may look as though that's not true because you will see a positive 0.5%. Uh, um, what you will see though is as soon as I hit end turn, that is actually going to change as the campaign effects and mechanics are going to kick in and those settlements that appeared to have population growth are going to be now static as you can see here. Now in the West this is more of a problem than for the East. We imagined that in the West especially these rather forlorn settlements uh, west of the Grey Havens. These are going to be the kind of places that the elves are going to be um, most susceptible to the yearning of the sea, right? They're going to want to sail into the west. So Forland and Harland are never going to be able to grow um, at all. And they start with extremely um, small population, 450, I believe, in each settlement. Yes. So what you're going to have to decide about these settlements in particular is what to do with them. Do I want to build up my military and train like one unit of elves out of here? Do I want to train uh, like a unit of ships maybe for some reason? Or do I want to possibly convert the population from elven to manish to get some population growth and actually stand uh, a reasonable chance of training some units out of here? They will not be elven units but they will be something that you can actually use. In other parts of your realm you will not necessarily need to to take this drastic step, but it might be worth it in those two settlements. Uh, in Karas Galadon and Amon Lank, although your population growth is static, you do have the option here of building up to the highest level of uh, gardens, and this will actually give you a population growth bonus of 0.5%. So it's not going to be huge, but in both of your Lorien settlements and in your northern Greenwood settlements, you can eventually get to the point of positive population growth once you get to this Gardens of the Silver Light. So you have to first build the Gardens of the Golden Light and then upgrade that to the Gardens of the Silver Light. Now the first settlement where you'll be able to see this, or the easiest way to see positive population growth, apart from Mithlond, which starts with a positive population growth, and by the way, um, I believe already has the building uh, built. Yes, it's already built here, so you, you won't be able to upgrade it any further than that. But the, the settlement where it's going to be easiest to get that upgrade is in the Elven King's Halls. And this is just because you already have all of the provincial development uh, necessities taken. You've already built those, and so now all you need to do is just build these two buildings. Whereas in a settlement like Amon Lank, you've only got the minor province. You need to build up to urban province and then to the major province level, before you can actually get to the Gardens of the Silver Light and see positive population growth. And what that means is that you'll have basically in the early game two places to train elves out of. The Elven King's Halls uh, and over in Mithlon. Every other place is going to be maybe training one elven unit at best uh, and so you'll have and, and it'll be quite some time before you can see that growth. So in those early years uh, you're going to be very limited. You're going to actually for the most part throughout the campaign you're going to be very limited in what elven troops you have at your disposal. But again, the advantage is they're going to be so good that you're going to be able to do a lot with the little that you have. All right, let's talk a bit about that other settlement that I mentioned, Austin Edel. And I will remove the fog of war uh, again so we can get a better sense of the starting position and also talk tactics and strategy in addition to all the rest of it. So Austin Edel is, uh, is a ruined minor settlement. And by that I mean it's essentially a fort. 
So uh, across the strategic map, map, you'll find these permanent forts like the North Guard Fort, South Guard Fort, the Watchtower of Amon Sul. These are places where your building options are extremely limited, but they are these small fortified places that often occupy some strategic importance or just historically we know that they were there. Austin Edel, though, is a ruin. And again, it represents that uh, ancient Second Age Noldor um, area of, of Holland. And so what you can do if you are playing as the elves, you need to take it for your victory conditions, but you can actually rebuild it. What you need to rebuild it uh, is an elven character, a family member, who meets certain criteria in terms of traits. So let's go over those, and I'll use the example of Glorfindel just because he's, he's conveniently here. So the first thing you need to look for, if you're interested in rebuilding Austin Edel, which you, you probably are, is the uh, subculture of the elf lord that you're going to you're going to need. And there are two options here. You can have a Naldor, Naldo, or a Cinda, or Sindar, uh, version of elf, basically. So these two subcultures um, are the ones that could potentially give you the right combination of traits. So when it comes to adoptions, potential marriages, and, and any time you get a new family member, whether through coming of age or anything else, um, do check those those traits. The, the, the elven character who will be able to rebuild Austin Edel needs to be either a Cinda or a Naldo. There are two other types of elves in terms of subcultures. Uh, one of them is uh, Galadel, I believe is the name of it. Yes, Galadel and Nando is the fourth. Right, and neither of these two are going to help. You're going to need one of the Naldor or one of the Sindar uh, to build Austin Edel for you because traditionally it was associated more with those types rather than the, the wood elf types uh, more over into the east. The other traits you're going to want to look for are the energetic, intelligent, charismatic traits. You will need both an intelligent and a charismatic uh, elf to rebuild Austin Edel. If it says unintelligent or uncharismatic, that's not going to work. And finally, you're going to need something else which does not appear here, and that is you will need a character who, in addition to all of the above, is uh, either farsighted or a true seer. So those are a couple of, of, uh, of options there. So just keep an eye on those adoptees um, and uh, marriage offers, and try to hold out for a Naldo or a Cinda elf who meets those criteria. And I will link below to a uh, a faction guide I wrote a while ago for the elves, which still holds basically true, that has that information written out, so you don't need to frantically write it down here. Austin Elder, though, once you do get a, a an elven family member in here who can grow it, will give you some nice advantages. Uh, you will be able to, to actually grow the population. You will not be able to recruit elves out of here. You will be with the mannish recruitment types, um, but that's fine. Uh, that actually allows you to make better use of the income potential here because the population growth will be higher. And there is a decent amount of income to make in the settlement even before it's built up thanks to this uh, gemstone resource that is here. And if you get trade going with the dwarves um, and all of your neighbors, which you should, then money will be, uh, money will be in pretty good. Let's talk really quickly then about the the Manish roster, because <clears throat> so far we've been talking about the Elven options, but there are these four tiers of military development, uh, and the fourth tier is reserved uh, for uh, the highest level of Elvelin. This is um, a, a this is a word that means elf friends, and so this is the way that you can actually expand beyond your borders and train something, even if it's not your elves. So. Once you start conquering places outside of your starting settlements, you are not going to be able to recruit elves uh, at all. There's no way for you to uh, bring a, an elven population over to Sarn Ford, let's say, and start cranking elven troops out of here. The only one place you can train elves out of eventually will be Rivendell. So you definitely want to take that back, um, and then you can get some, some really excellent units out of there. But every other place on the map that you conquer uh, will be for mannish troops, that is these Elvelin. And pretty much this is the roster you're going to see everywhere, whether you're conquering off down in Harad or Rune for some reason, um, or the more likely thing in, you know, in and around your starting settlements of, let's say, Eriador and the Anduin Vales. You're going to see these guys. 
So you have uh, four tiers of these. At the first tier, you will find Elvel and Watch, your basic militia type, along with some javelins. Now this is actually kind of notable for the elves. They don't otherwise have any throwing spear units. So this might be the one that you favor a bit more when having to choose between these two. At the second tier, uh, Elvil and Wardens. This is a sword and shield unit. Uh, quite good. Uh, foresters are bows and Elvil and guards are the highest tier uh, spear, shield, good armor. All of these guys are uh, relatively, uh, rel relative to the elven units, quite a bit weaker, uh, but of course they are. The elven troops have multiple hit points and just the best of everything. Uh, but these are the guys we imagined who would have liked to support the elven realm in its decline, and so you can find them in various places around the map, basically every place that you conquer that has a mannish population. And to that end, you might even consider converting some of your own elven settlements to that mannish population. How you would do it <clears throat> is you would build this red book building, which you can see in pretty much every settlement you own and every settlement you conquer. It's going to have one of these red books. Now currently, if I look at Harland, uh, currently it says elven lands. These are elven lands. So the idea here is that in a place that is elven lands, there will be an elven population, and that's the type of units you can train. But if I convert it to the building known as Lindon, what I'm doing is actually settling men in the province. So you can do this if you want, but the, the danger is you, you want to watch out for buyer's remorse. This is a one-way trip. So if you build this, you cannot destroy it and get elven recruitment back. This is, this is something you have to decide. And it can be very expensive and time-consuming to do. So it's certainly not a priority early on, but given the fact that these two places will never grow, you might want to consider doing it. Okay, so those are the basics on population, um, recruitment, and so on. Let's talk a bit about strategy here. Uh, I've already mentioned that Glorfindel and the Noldor Swords are really two of your best units. What I tend to do early on is get just about everything out of the Mithlond region, send them under Glorfindel, and march off into the east. We do want to get Rivendell early, and so we want to cut a bloody swath through our enemies on the way there. And our enemy is the Kingdom of Adunabar. This, for those of you who are not aware, is the, the sort of the bad guy of the mod. These are the, uh, the rebel cultists in the civil war between them and the reunited kingdom. And this is all, of course, based on a, uh, an abandoned short story that Tolkien began writing called The New Shadow, in which he envisioned that in the long peace after the War of the Ring, uh, men would grow tired of that, and they would fall back into dark cultic practices and so on. And so we imagined that in this mod, uh, maybe even a full-blown civil war might be the result. And so as a, as, a, as a consequence of that, you have this purple faction, the Kingdom of Adunabar, starting off very strong in Mordor and Athelion, and uh, very strong indeed in the uh, eastern part of, um, of the, the northern territories that once belonged to the reunited kingdom. And so you can see that the, your allies the, uh, in black here, the Reunited Kingdom, are quite limited in the north. And so what you can do is step in to save them before they get completely destroyed. What I like to do is head down south, actually, with Glorfindel and your, your strong initial army and march them through this rebel territory over to Sarnford and take that. There's no walls here. It's a pretty small rebel garrison, so it's something you can take very easily without even waiting the siege out. Because again, with Glorfindel, time is of the essence. You don't want to be waiting around with sieges for him. Uh, and then head right over to Three Ways. Uh, by that time, what may have happened is Adunabar may have taken Bree or Amonsul, and you can grab those at your leisure as well. And then you can head east over to uh, Last Ridge, which is an important settlement in part because it's a chief city. This is a, an important recruitment center for Adunabar, and if you take that, you, then Rivendell becomes very defensible. Another thing you might consider, or simultaneously, uh, is taking some of your troops from another relatively strong position, your capital, and gathering them and sending them west, uh, and maybe over the High Pass stronghold. This is the only route um, over the mountains towards Rivendell, and it's not that far from your starting capital. The problem here is that the Bjornings um, are going to be commanding the only ford over the river, uh, or you could head way up to the north and around Framsburg, which is in the, 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 uh, the possession of Dale. Either one of those, I, I guess, would be fine. Um, but if you head down from your capital 
towards the Bjornings and maybe maybe even grab a settlement like Andlang by sending some troops up from Lorien, you can get yourself relatively connected to all your other realms here. Now the dangers in this part of the world are the neighboring factions. Unfortunately, that will include the Bjornings and the Men of Dale. And this is unfortunate because I would love nothing better than just to sit back and trade with them until the end of the game. Uh, but this being a Rome Total War engine, uh, you know, the, the AI is trying to win. But here's something for you to consider if you, like me, are a little sad at the thought of having to fight um, other factions like Dale as the Elves. In every single Manish faction that appears in the mod, family members have the potential to become cultic, to, in other words, turn to the Shadow Cult. So you can imagine easily that these other factions are being darkened by this newly grown shadow and are um, are just asserting their their pride and their, uh, their, their 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 cultic energies I suppose so that might be one way to justify the fact that they have just suddenly backstabbed you while you are away trying to take back Rivendell or something um, but honestly it's going to be quite some time uh, before Dale does this um, and you know they may not Although, I, I think in pretty much every campaign I've had, they do eventually uh, try to attack you. Let's actually take a quick look at where I am right now, and um, we'll see how that's going. Because I am really close to uh, my, my total uh, of provinces needed for victory in this game. I have, I'm at uh, 390, so that's 80 or so turns in, and, uh, and it's, it's been pretty straightforward. I did essentially as I described here, but I did make some mistakes as you can see. Elven King's Halls has fallen, uh, although Dale has, has come under my control, so a bit of a tit for tat going on here. But I think the mistake that I made was I didn't leave hardly any troops in here. I think I had maybe a governor and a unit of your threshold spears. And the AI, if they, a, if they see a very uh, low garrison force in a settlement, they're going to be uh, very drawn to attacking it. So be aware of that. Try not to take out everything from your capital, especially since this is so close to Dale's starting position. But you know, if they do attack you, and if you have some archers, you've got some good units, you should be able to, to take it back. Um, I'm doing quite well. Otherwise, the Bjornings did attack me, uh, but I've taken Old Ford, Grim Hold from them, the Gladden Hold as well, and I've held my control over the High Pass and Rivendell and all the rest of it. Uh, in the south, and this is something you're going to run into as well, your southern two settlements are going to become targets uh, fairly early uh, by the Bjornings or more likely a Dunabar. And you can see a Dunabar is doing really well at this point. Uh, they've got me under siege with some trolls and berserkers and orcs, and it's just horrible. Um, I, though, I think I've got pretty good odds of holding this off. Maybe I'm too optimistic, but I've got a family member here, which is always a good thing. Um, and I've got uh, some Elven Threshold troops, some Javelin men, and some Elven Wardens as well. The other thing is, Elven Settlements, uh, and we'll, we, we may take a look at this uh, in, in another video, Elven, Elven Settlements, Elven Settlements rather, are very easy to defend. They are up on a very high hill, and so when troops finally do get to you, they are going to be extremely tired, and a lot of times you can pull out a victory that you would have thought impossible just based on that, that big advantage. Over in the west, I did pretty much what I just recommended here and went over to Sarnford, Three Ways, Bree, Amonsul, and so on. But I also got into trouble with Tharbad, which was actually fine with me because it just made it easier for me to, uh, once I conquered their, their territories here, I could head over to Swanfleet and Austin Edel. And then I, I pretty much have this choke point, which is actually very important. And, uh, and very good trade here, by the way. Three Ways to Bree, Sarnford, and the Northguard Four here as well as Tharbad, uh, is, is really good for your income. So once I had taken up to Bree, this little uh, corner of territory, uh, you know, trading with the Shire, trading with the Dwarves, who are my neighbors, I was in a pretty decent economic position. And ever since then, I've basically just been holding this line of the, the East-West Road and waiting for a Dunabar to, um, to make a move while I take care of business elsewhere. So I am at, I believe, 25 settlements and I'm only five away, but it is always those last five that seem to take the longest. Uh, but in any case, I hope this has been helpful. This is just a quick kind of overview about the Elven campaign. I will, as I said, link to that video of the written guide 
uh, in the description here below. And let me know if you would like to see a different faction next. I will be uh, coming out with a battle guide for the elves uh, fairly soon, so keep an eye out for that. And I hope you join me on the next one. Bye-bye, everybody.